We begin in New York and a heated session of the United Nations Security Council, a meeting where hopes were dashed of moving closer to an end to the conflict between Israel and Hamas militants. Israel's foreign minister launched a furious attack on the head of the UN, Antonio Guterres. Israel's ambassador to the UN also called on Guterres to resign. The UN chief had earlier criticized Israel's bombardment of Gaza and called for an end to what he described as the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. It is important to also recognize the attacks by Hamas did not happen in a vacuum. The Palestinian people have been subjected to 56 years of suffocating occupation. They have seen their land steadily devoured by settlements and plagued by violence. Their economy stifled, their people displaced, and their homes demolished. Their hopes for a political solution to their plight have been vanishing. But the grievances of the Palestinian people cannot justify the appalling attacks by Hamas, and those appalling attacks cannot justify the collective punishment of the Palestinian people. Well, those comments by the UN chief angered Israel's foreign minister, Eli Cohen. Mr. Secretary General, in what world do you live? Definitely, this is not our world. All right, let's go now to our very own Ines Paul. She is at the UN following this heated session for us today. Ines, and that's what it was, a heated session. Talk to me about it. It was indeed a heated session, uh, Brent, and uh, that someone really asked the Secretary General to step down doesn't happen all the time. Brent, I had the top, uh, chance to talk to some top diplomats who attended this uh, Security Council uh, meeting here uh, behind me, and none is really happy with what Secretary General Guterres said here. Many do understand that it is important to give some context uh, to explain to the world that this is the... Uh, attack from Hamas is not happening in a vacuum, but hardly anybody really, uh, well, that's not true, what I say. I should uh, rephrase that, uh, Brent. Hardly anybody from the Western allies, from those uh, uh, who are supporting uh, Israel as well, uh, uh, applause uh, the outspokenness of, of uh, uh, Secretary uh, General Guterres. They would have liked a little bit more a diplomatic way uh, uh, to talk about the humanitarian crisis which is unfolding in Gaza right now. Yeah, that's a very good point. We also know that Germany's foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock, she is due to address the council today. Earlier, she repeated her stance that Israel has the right to defend itself, but that civilians, she said, on both sides need protection. Take a listen. For me, as German foreign minister, it's clear that Israel has the right, indeed the duty, to protect its population, its country, within the framework of the right to self-defense and international law. But standing up for Israel's security also means keeping in mind the suffering of the Palestinians in Gaza. We see their suffering. It is unbearable. Every civilian life is worth the same, both Israeli and Palestinian. So, Ines, those are comments we've heard from the foreign minister before. What are we expecting to hear from her later today? Right, Brent, I had the chance to talk to her twice uh, very early this morning and just uh, an hour or so ago. She is known that in the heart of her, poli uh, of her foreign policy is her feminist approach, is her approach to really put women and children in the middle of her action. And she was talking about that she just met Palestinian refugees uh, in Jordan not so long ago. So she definitely feels uh, for the Palestinians being stuck in Gaza. But as a German foreign minister, there is no doubt that she stands strong with Israel and definitely supports Israel's right to defend itself. And this is something uh, she will uh, talk about. She probably we will also talk about that peace can only take place if it means it's peace for everyone. Again, she's trying to walk this fine line, on the one hand supporting Israel's rights to defend itself, but on the other hand also shine some light on the horrible situation for so many mm. civilians within Gaza. 
And at the end of the day, Enos, how much leverage does the U.N. Security Council really have um, when it comes to this crisis? I mean, how much pressure can it bring to bear? Well, the problem, Brian, always is uh, that full members of the Security Council do have the right to veto any resolution. That's one reason why uh, the United States didn't apply their resolution today. They are still negotiating with Russia and China. But having that said, this is the only body in the world where leaders from all around the world at least do come together and sit uh, in one room and listen to each other, talk with each other. So it's definitely not perfect, but what is out there, what is better than the UN? That's our very own Enos Pohl there with the latest from UN headquarters in New York. Enos, thank you. The Hamas militant group says that more than 5,700 people have now been killed by Israeli airstrikes in Gaza. Israel's blockade is also causing acute shortages of food, water, medicine, and fuel. The UN agency, which helps refugees in Gaza, says that it may have to stop its operations unless more fuel is delivered. And this lack of fuel, it's hindering already stretched emergency services. The bloodstained wreckage of an ambulance in Gaza. This vehicle was crushed by the blast from an Israeli airstrike, but it will serve one last purpose. We're running out of fuel, so we have been taking petrol and diesel from the damaged ambulances and using it to fuel the ones that are working. Gaza's ambulance drivers and medics have been working around the clock and at great personal risk since Israel began bombing the Strip. The Hamas-controlled health ministry says that over 5,000 people have been killed in the bombing. We're having great difficulty transporting the injured. Also because there are several strikes going on at the same time. There are also a lack of communication. It's almost non-existent. In addition to its air campaign, Israel has enforced a complete blockade of the Gaza Strip, allowing only a trickle of aid since the Hamas terrorist attacks on October 7. It claims that Hamas is hoarding petrol and is refusing to let in any fuel as part of the deliveries. With more and more ambulances destroyed and fuel running out, Gaza's emergency services could soon become defunct, at a time when their work is more important than ever. I spoke with Ahmed Bayram from the Norwegian Refugee Council and he told me what would happen if the UN Relief Agency has to end its operations in Gaza due to a lack of fuel? It means another lifeline cut, simple as that. It means it's, um, it is indeed a game of survival now for the 2.3 million people in Gaza. The trickle of aid that has been uh, crossing from Rafa into Gaza is nowhere near enough. I mean, um, on one day we had 20,000 bottles of water, for example, and that um, is hardly enough for 1% of the, of the, of the population. 65% um, of the population is now displaced, living in uh, overcrowded shelters that um, continue to be bombed. Uh, cutting fuel on top of cutting water, electricity and food uh, means that the humanitarian catastrophe that we, that we are witnessing will continue to unfold, will mean uh, babies um, in their uh, hospital beds are at risk, uh, in their incubators. Uh, people who are, um, who are on ventilators will be at risk of, of uh, preventable death. And of course, uh, hospitals will not be able to tend to the injured and wounded mm. uh, in the meantime. Well, Mr. Byram, isn't that, that, isn't that the biggest emergency at this hour is the, the plight of the hospitals? I mean, we have reports that at least three hospitals in Gaza have said that they have run out of fuel completely. What, what does that mean then if you don't have the power for incubators, as you were saying, people who need dialysis? Uh, what, what's happening to these people? Um, it is. It is. Um, unfortunately, we're facing a life or death scenario here. I mean, this has been the case for th almost uh, three weeks now. Um, you know, children are, are paying the price of, of what's happening more than anybody else. And, um, of course, the hospitals that rely on this fuel, uh, they have 
not just uh, not days but but hours i mean these hours will feel like eternity for for people who you know um you know these hours without fuel will feel like eternity some some hospitals have been already uh, like you said i think it's 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 closer to 10 hospitals uh, who uh, you know that have completely stopped uh, operations mm-hmm. uh, not just hospitals we're looking at bakeries we're looking at sewage systems that you know hardly running and uh, just to mention finally here um the, the water situation because people are now uh, drinking, uh, let's say, semi-contaminated water with the switching off of of, of, uh, of these stations. Yeah. It means that people will, will definitely drink polluted water, and and children will do as well. Yeah, and then, then when you talk about the the threat of cholera, for example, when you have unsanitary conditions, what about your staff on the ground in Gaza? I mean, are they able to carry out any of their duties? I mean, what are, what are they telling you? This is the first time. I mean, we have been in Gaza since 2009. We have over 50, 50 people on the ground. Uh, the majority of them, like the rest of the population, have been displaced by uh, by the, you know, the actions and the constant bombardment, uh, we are not able to provide um, as much aid as we have been over the past conflicts. This is the first time in a conflict scenario we're not able to reach people we need to reach. We have been providing some cash assistance for, for people to just get the basics, really, some food and water. But again, with 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 hardly any aid coming coming across from Rafa. There's not much in the market to sustain these people, and there's not much aid to sustain these people. This is why another appeal from us it goes out to open humanitarian corridors, open up a crossing, let the aid in, and mm-hmm. let people have some relief. And of course, of course, of course, protect aid workers on the ground. Yeah. Ahmed Bayram with the Norwegian Refugee Council. We appreciate your time tonight. Thank you.